systems and institutions are made by people and they're also upheld by people and they can only be torn down by people. Leila Saad is author of Me and White Supremacy. The Sunday Times and New York Times bestseller has helped to expand the narrative around what it is to be anti-racist and encourages people to search out and address their own biases and attitudes towards race. Leila is an educator, writer, speaker and podcast host with an insightful intersection of identities as an East African, Arab, British, black Muslim woman who was born and grew up in the West and now lives in the Middle East. As well as race, Leila's work covers identity, personal transformation and social change. And she's just released a young adult version of Me and White Supremacy to introduce the challenge of making a personal and collective change to a younger audience. As Leila says, you don't just read the book, you do the book. A warm welcome to Times Radio, Leila. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm absolutely fascinated and enthralled by what we're going to discuss for the next 20 minutes or so, Leila. But I feel like we need to not assume knowledge on behalf of our listeners, because some will know about white supremacy and white Mm. privilege in depth and some won't. So let's Mm. start off with the basics. What is white supremacy? How do we define it? Yeah. So for those who maybe don't have that, like you said, that knowledge, that context, that background, they may hear that term white supremacy and feel it's a very strong word, a very accusatory word, <laughs> you know, a very aggressive word, and not maybe understand what that has to do with them because they don't self-identify as white supremacists, don't self-identify as racists, don't believe that racism should exist. And so maybe don't understand why they should read a book like this or what impact it has on them. The thing to understand about white supremacy first is that it is a, if we break down the term, it is a a belief, a philosophy, um, a, 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 yeah, a belief or a philosophy that people who are white or who look white are superior, inherently superior to people of other races, and therefore they deserve to be dominant over people of other races. Now, again, people may hear that and say, well, I don't believe that. That, again, has nothing to do with what I believe or with how I was raised. But the thing about white supremacy is that it operates at multiple levels, personal, systemic and institutional. And it also has roots that started way before any of us were here and that unfortunately still exist today. The roots of white supremacy began with the roots of European colonialism with Europeans traveling to different parts of the world, to countries um, or lands um, uh, predominantly inhabited by black and brown people, first for trade, but then later for extraction of resources, of land, of people, and the spread of uh, capitalism that went alongside with that. But with with, with that expansion, there was also a need to justify why the need to take that power, why the need to take those resources. And so, scientific racism, which was developed by uh, scientists in the 16th and 17th centuries, would break down um, people who look different into different categories, different races, and attribute different um, attributes to them. They would say things like, uh, th- those who are black are, are lazy, um, or they're, um, they're, they're aggressive, or, they're, or they're, they steal things, right? Those who are brown are, are, are savages are very primitive. They don't really, they don't have the same brains as us, but those who are white are the most beautiful race, the most, the smartest, um, the most desirable. And so you begin to, they begin to make this distinction between different types of humans, which we now know, um, you know, has been proven. There are no, there's only one race, which is the human race. Um, <laughs> there's no biological difference. There's no there biological difference. Us. Absolutely. No biological difference at all between us. But that was only scientifically proven very, very recently in human history. And so you had this um, scientific um, foundation that was also being used by those who were seeking to to take power. And so when we bring it into today, the way that that um, operates is both in, in personal relationships and the power dynamics between people of color and white people, but then also most more importantly, systemically and institutionally, where systemically and institutionally, black and brown people are denied the same privileges as white people, denied the same safeties as white people, um, and are, and are, you know, are receiving different outcomes on their quality of life, purely on the basis of race. 
Yeah, now there may be some people listening thinking, I understand that and I get that. We've spent centuries being conditioned uh, to think as white people, I'm a white person, to think that we are superior. Even if we don't vocalise it, there are ways that we act. We might get defensive, for example, if someone challenges us with having white privilege. Um, And we have to, we have to, sort of back away from that and break that down and understand why we might feel defensive and feeling defensive if you're sat here listening to this uh, you know saying well I don't do that well I don't partake in that then that's then that's you being a little bit defensive and having to face uh, face your own fears I suppose or face your own prejudices I don't think we can well I don't think we can blame anyone for having white privilege, for example, but we need to understand it and we need to understand why we think that way and then we need to challenge it. And uh, the mm. book is a lot about trying to then work on it and, it and it will have opened up so many eyes, I'm sure. Do you, do you get people even now, Leila, who, um, who are affronted by the notion of white supremacy, who, maybe, who, who actually mm. think, I, mean, I can imagine my mum, bless her, thinking, well, I'm not a white supremacist. I'm not anything to do with the far right. And so this yeah, book yeah. isn't anything to do with me. Do you, do you yeah, still yeah, get yeah. that now? Um, I, think, I think that that's a normal reaction. You know, that the important thing that I'm saying is I'm, I'm not accusing anyone of anything. And I'm also, I, I, don't, I also don't think it's helpful to label people as uh, you're a white supremacist or you're a racist, unless they self-identify as such, right? Unless yeah. those are their stated ideological beliefs. But the majority of people, those aren't their stated, consciously you know, held beliefs. Rather, what's happening, and this is why it was really important for me to write this, uh, the Young Readers edition of Me and White Supremacy, from, from the moment that we were born, in fact, before we were even born, but from the moment that we are born, we are constantly being sent messages by society, whether it's the people around us at school, the media, TV, social media, whatever it is, that white people are the standard for humanity. That is what we're all supposed to be striving for. That's what it means to be human, to be fully human, is to be white. And what do I mean by that? I mean, I grew up Um, as a as a black Muslim girl in Wales and you know I went to predominantly white schools predominantly Christian schools and so I was always the only the only (laughs) basically in my class and in my surroundings but that's not that's not anybody's fault that's just you know that's just the situation as it was but what was happening as I was growing up was constantly on tv in the magazines that I would read when I was a little preteen all I saw the main characters, the models, the people who were front and center were white. And I did not see people who looked like me. And so what's the message that's being that's being sent? Those who are worthy of being seen, those who are worthy of being in, the, in these positions are white. And that's not you. And therefore, you're not fully human in the same way um, white people are. So we're both being sent messages, right? White people are being subtly sent the message that you're the standard for humanity. You are the norm. You are what is normal. And the rest of us are being sent the message. You are other. You are different. And so none of us have escaped that. None of us have not been influenced by the messages of white supremacy. And the work and the practice of anti-racism is actually um, willing to go inwards and, and to explore what have I been taught about myself and about the world that I did not even realize what's sitting there in my subconscious that I think are um, truths that I don't even realize uh, influence how I show up in the world or how the world treats me. And if I have these values that say, I don't believe racism should exist, I want to be anti-racist, what do I need to change in order to help create that world? You quote in the book, Peggy McIntosh, who in 1988 defined white privilege um, and, and, and I think this is this is a really good explainer really for people still mm. trying to get their head around it um, and she said I've come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day about which I was meant to remain oblivious um, and that's and that for me is a really good starting point for someone you know thinking about thinking about what it is to have white privilege an unearned package of assets yeah. that we don't realize we're using we're not aware we're using and which we're meant to not be aware we're using and of course then we then we start to start to develop um, an understanding and your book me and, me and white supremacy is 
is brilliant at that. Um, it is it is a piece of work. It is a workbook. It isn't a read it and then I get it. Oh, great. I've read it now. I understand. I've checked off this, this and this mm. and it's done. It is it is a constant work. Um, in terms of you personally, how did you get to the point where you published this book? Mm. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting journey because I'm certainly not an academic uh, scholar or have a background in, um, you know, history. I, I'm a learner. I'm someone who loves to learn. But more than that, you know, I'm a I'm a black person <laughs> living in the world. And so I have my own personal experiences. But what really activated me into this work was actually um, in 2017, um, I wrote an article in the um, aftermath of the Unite the Right rally that happened in Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, where that article was born from was my frustration with the world which was in, which is very much like the coaching world and the personal growth, personal development, spirituality world that was predominantly, you know, it was predominantly white women in that space. And they would often talk about, we're here to do work that's here to change the world. And we're going to fight the patriarchy and we're going to, you know, take back our power and we're going to make the world a better place. And yet I never heard them talk about race ever. And I thought, yeah. how, how, how is, how is it that people who are so skilled at the work of transformation and healing and change and have these really strong beliefs about changing the world, don't see that race is a huge factor in that. And so I wrote this article called, I need to talk to spiritual white women about white supremacy. And it ended up going viral, very viral, very fast. And it really, um, uh, it, it spurred me into this public conversation, which again, for the first time, I, I had not done that before. This wasn't a conversation mm. I was having, um, but it was, it was an article that I, I felt like you have a responsibility i me i had a responsibility to say something and i felt that the people that i was writing to that their hearts were in the right place that they maybe self-identified as liberal or um progressive but they could not see their their own their own ways of contributing to white supremacy and so i was addressing them directly but it ended up striking a chord with <laughs> an audience far bigger than that um and <laughs> And got me into um, basically nonstop conversations with white people wow. about white supremacy, which was uh, exhausting um, because of what you were saying. Ask if you a lot were of ready for that. I was yeah. not ready for it. I mean, first of all, I don't think most people are ready for an article to go viral no. on any topic. On any topic, it's it's quite intense. But when you are a, a black Muslim woman. Um, and there's a sea of, of, of white people who want to understand why are you saying these things to us? Um, it, it, it's, it, it can be really, really intense because I think as a black woman, there's already a preconceived stereotype that people have of black women, that we are inherently aggressive and mean and that we also aren't vulnerable and don't have feelings. Um, and then when you bring in the topic itself, it's just, it's like uh, throwing a match into, into a stack of hay. Uh, so it was very intense. It was very intense. But what I noticed after a year of that was that there began this shift. I think I'd had the conversation so often that people were like, oh, I get what she's saying now. She's not saying I'm a white supremacist. She's <laughs> saying that we live in a world yeah. that, you know, white supremacy is a paradigm that we all live within and that we've all been given these messages and that I have privileges that I'm unaware of, but I'm becoming aware of them now. And so when I hear the word white supremacy, I don't feel personally attacked anymore. I actually feel a responsibility to find out more and to learn and to listen. And so one night, um, as I said, it was a year after that article, I started questioning myself, like, I noticed they're less defensive with me. What's shifted? What's changed? And so I started writing an, uh, an Instagram post uh, call, uh, and said, you know, what have you learned about you and white supremacy? And I realized that's a big question. <laughs> they might not know what I mean <laughs> when I say that. Let me break down what white supremacy means. And I started writing these um, prompts. You know, what have you learned about you and cultural appropriation? What have you learned about you and white feminism? What have you learned about you and white centering? And I had dozens of them. 
And I realized this is bigger than an, a single Instagram post. I think this is a journey that I want to take people on. And so that same night, I put it out online and I said, hey, tomorrow we're going to start a, a 28 day journey. Um, anyone who has white privilege can join. It's free. Um, but every day I'm going to share a different aspect of white supremacy. And I'm going to ask you to come journal on, in the comments section about what you've learned about yourself and this particular aspect of white supremacy. And that uh, challenge ended up going viral and, and becoming, um, uh, you know, this big um, movement, really. Um, you know, thousands of people joined in. And then uh, six months after that was finished, I decided to take that same thing, expand it and published it as a workbook that I also gave away for free. That also went viral. And then um, publishers came calling and said, this needs to be out in the world in a bigger yeah. way. And then I yeah. realized, yes, it, it does. It really does. So you went from what doing like a newsletter, um, mm. maybe to a few hundred people to then suddenly mm -hmm. thousands and then suddenly millions as yes. well. Yeah. And you also become the go-to. Mm. Um, you become the go-to woman on white supremacy largely and helping to explain white privilege. And, and people see the light and they wanna share that and they wanna share you as well. Mm. And suddenly you are, you are having to be, or you're being maybe made demands of, you, you know, pulled in all sorts of directions because you've got this wonderful message mm. and there is work to be done but I just wonder about the toll on you how do mm. how do you look after you when it started to get to go viral and people yeah. were seeing the light and there was this revelation they just wanted to tell everyone about you they wanted to point people in your direction they wanted you to come and speak at events they wanted you to share the knowledge how was that for you it's definitely a tricky a tricky line um, I think the biggest thing that I've learned on this journey is the ways in which white supremacy has has infiltrated, you know, me and and the, and how I think about myself. And so what this taught me, first of all, was, you know, I had to get very clear that I am a person and not a resource, um, and and I am worthy of of protection and safety um, and care. And that I have to be the first one to give it to myself because those who are um, uh, consuming the work, and I'm grateful for those who are who are doing the work, but they they are not they are, I am not their number one priority. Their learning is their number one priority, and so they're not going to prioritize taking care of me. I have to do that, mm. and so I've had to be really clear with myself on what are my internal boundaries, on what I'm okay with and what I'm not okay with, and then communicating those with people. Writing the book in and of itself actually is a boundary because I, I, I realize I can't be debating with people online every single day. Like I, it is so energy draining. Um, and I have other, other things that are important to me, my family, other, other avenues of yeah. creativity. And, and if people I'm are always going... going to challenge you as well, right? Absolutely. All... I, I Absolutely. mean, even if it's well-intentioned, you're going to be challenged. Yeah. Right. So writing the book was, hey, this is a boundary because I'm actually, I don't have the capacity to teach you this in a class or in the comment section of a post, but I can write it all down. I can do the research for you and I can try and lay it out in a way that makes sense uh, to as many people as possible and then have you take on the responsibility of the work um mm -hmm. i think that was a really important thing that i did to take care of myself um and more than that you know i i know that me and white supremacy is the work like you said i've become identified as one of those key people who people are learning from but i also have other things that are really important to me i host a, a podcast and a book club called good ancestor where we center and celebrate authors of color. That's something that really gives me joy. Um, I'm currently working on building some courses that are going to be about how people can use their voice to change the world. You know, obviously that's been a huge part of my journey and I wanna be able to, to support people in doing that. And just really recognizing, you know, I, um, I am not going to sacrifice myself um, in order for as many people as possible to be able to change like that's mm -hmm. that's actually that's actually me me turning white supremacy against myself because I'm saying yeah. I'm less important than 
than the white people who are learning from me. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. I'm equally important. So I yes. gotta take care you of then, me. You then turn into that person serving others, which you'll most definitely should be not, and is part right. of the conversation about right. about why we need to talk about white supremacy. Mm-hmm. Um the the adult version of the book was was published in Jan twenty twenty, mm-hmm. um, and then of course there was a seismic uh, event, a tragic uh, event mm-hmm. with the death of George Floyd a few months later, um, and we knew that people had been having the conversation about racism um, for a long time. You'd been talking about white supremacy. It was starting well. Your book was was selling what uh, really really well, but. But then a tragedy, a, you know, a crime, a blatant display of racism mm. makes your book go, not not just sell well, but go towards the top of the bestseller charts. You know, suddenly right. it becomes one of those books everyone's recommending. People are photographing piles of books and putting it on Instagram and saying, here is mm. my reading list for people wanting to engage in Black Lives Matter and understand why why we all need to change. And I wondered how that how that sat sat with you Mm. that this is a conversation we've been having but this huge event was what accelerated your book into being a huge part of the conversation not just a part it was um it was i mean even talking about it is really i find it really challenging because like you said the work had been there before this ever happened and the work has been there for 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 a very long time, a very, very long time. But this um, horrific event ha- um, at, at a time in our collective experience where we are uh, globally experiencing a pandemic, it was like all of these things all came together at once and it was this explosion. And you saw books like mine, books like Rennie Edo Lodges um, and, and, and David Olashoga and so many others um, are suddenly everywhere. And suddenly people want to want to learn and they want to understand. And um, on the one hand, that's great because we want people, we want people to learn and to understand, but it shouldn't have to come at the expense of somebody's life. Right. And this is, this is a frustration that I have is that in particular in publishing as well, um, but this fr- this frustration that I have is that black um, and brown um, thought leadership and creativity and teachings are only um, are on- only become big in that way in the aftermath of black trauma and pain and literal murder, mm. right? Actual violence against black bodies. That's when a massive white people will say, hey, maybe we should think about this. And again, only because it was seen. Yes. Right? Because yeah. we know that this 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 isn't the first, it won't be the last. But because it was seen and, and the way that it was captured, that's why that happened. And so um, I, I, I found that after that period of um, intense, like, can we, you know, can we interview you about your book? And can we talk about this? And I had to say, I said yes to a few things, but I had to say no to many others um, Mm. because it just felt so wrong. It just felt so, so wrong. And in the end, you know, I had to come to a place within myself. I had to take some time off to really process this, right? Um, But I had to take some time to think about, okay, what do I actually feel about this? And what do I actually think about this um, for myself? And I think for myself, it's I'm going to show up and do the work that's important, whether or not something like this is happening. Mm. Right. Because I, I, I did this work before this. Um, yeah. Yeah. But because of it. Um, and it and and it's really important for me to not get swept up in that white urgency, because I know it will it will peak and then it will come back. And down it will again. burn out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I just shared an article yesterday that was um, written by, I think, Natalie Morris in the Metro, where it said there's been a 23% drop in uh, black characters in in children's books since 2020. Mm. And meanwhile, a 17% increase in in, in white children's books in that same period, which has been apparently the largest increase in the last 10 years. Wow. And so suddenly, 
you know we are we are forgetting aren't mm-hmm. we we are it's 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 top of everyone's agendas it's part of people's corporate strategy people are having conversations about it there are workshops at big organizations and big corporations we're seeing representation but there's no there's little point unless it's going to sustain there's little point right. pledging something for a year in the wake of the death of George Floyd and then and then not learning from it and not continuing it um, yeah. And is that, and it's, it's, is that is that where we are now? Do you think? I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, mm. does does the um, lack of black characters in children's books compared to twenty twenty does that does that paint a story of of where we are in society now? I think it's where we've always been. I think it comes in cycles. I think there's mm. times when tragedies happen like that, and there's this rise, there's this explosion, there's this interest, and then the new cycle moves on and uh, people forget and it it it's really frustrating to me that black life doesn't trend but black death does right black life as in black humanity and the honoring of our our human selves and our lives isn't isn't what's seen as worthy of protecting but when we but when something horrific like that happens that's when people you know, are like, hey, maybe we should look at this, but only for a little while. Um, because we, you know, there's, you know, we're kind of getting tired of it, you know, mm-hmm. and I give a, I give it, I give a TED talk, um, a TEDx talk last year in Vienna, um, about how reading books by authors of color can help us to reclaim our humanity. You know, those books have been always been written, you know, we've always been writing, but they haven't been published at the same rates, you know, they haven't been celebrated in the same way, they haven't been the best sellers in that same way. And, um, and I said, you know, our books shouldn't only be published when we're writing about anti racism, when we're writing about our pain, as it relates to the trauma and violence of, of, of racial harm. You know, we read read black books about romance and sci fi and yes. you know, yeah, comedy a, and all yeah. of them, you know. It's like the black history month thing as well, you know. Why would you mm-hmm. only spend October celebrating Black History mm-hmm. Month? It just should be interwoven in our in our curriculums and in our education. Absolutely. Um absolutely. Um what humbles you mm. in this process? What humbles me is that I talk about white privilege, right? And the, the privilege that of, of, of whiteness and being seen as more whole and, and that list by Peggy McIntosh. But what, what humbles me is the privilege that I have that I can, I can channel this into writings and I can use my creativity in that way. And I, I don't have to put myself in harm's way to do this work. It keeps me really humble to know that there are people who have come before me who had to suffer a lot more than I did. Um, And so even while anti-blackness and misogynoir, which is, you know, a a mixture of anti-blackness plus uh, sexism is a part of my lived reality, um, I'm, I'm not in the same level as of harm as those who come before me. And Mm -hmm. so I talk about this concept of being a good ancestor. And I say, we have to become good ancestors in honor of the ancestors who came before us, you know, and in service of the descendants who will come after we're gone. Each generation has their work to do. And I'm humbled that I get to be here and do my work and to remember, it's just one, I'm just adding one brick to the building here, you know, and then passing it along to the next generation. And you've got two kids, Myra and mm. Mohammed. And I wondered in the book you speak about how your mum sat you down when you lived in in Wales yeah. in the UK and and had to explain how how the colour of your skin would influence you and and influence the people around you and what that meant. Mm. Um, have you had to have that conversation with your kids? Not necessarily in the same way. They are. Um they are living in a different environment to the one that I grew up in. They are not the only kids of color, Um, but they are black kids. And we live in a world where around the world, um, you know, blackness is something that carries 
uh, it carries a history. It it carries um, it carries a stereotype, um, a stigma, but also there's a lot of strength and pride and celebration in there. And so I talk to them about identity, and I do talk to them about. I have to talk to them about racism and white supremacy and what these things all mean. Um, mm -hmm. Because if I didn't, I wouldn't be preparing them for the world that exists. And I also wouldn't be empowering them to notice it when it's happening to other people and make sure that they are saying something when they see it happening to somebody else. And by and large, in those three or four decades since your mum had that conversation with you, we've perhaps touched on this a little bit already, but but are you are you positive about the change that's been made or are or are we still are we still a bit tbc on it are we still mm. going through this process trying to learn trying to get better and we haven't seen a sustainable change yet have we mm -hmm. i mean we can we can certainly say that the, the types of books that we're seeing out in the world now and the types of conversations that we're seeing were not happen happening at that same same level as they were you know 30 40 years ago so certainly there's been a change in people's willingness and comfortability to have these conversations. I mean, my mom, when she read my book for the first time, she called me crying. Um, and wow. she said, first of all, I can't believe you wrote this, but also everything that you're saying in here is everything that we experienced when we moved from uh, East Africa to Wales and were immigrants and you know we're being called names and and experiencing all of these things and we couldn't name it and we also we also just wanted to make a nice life for ourselves so we just tried to ignore it and tried to protect you um, but now she's like she sees it everywhere she's like that's white supremacy you know she understands <laughs> it now um, but I think what real change is required is is change at that systemic and institutional level. That's where real change happens. My contribution to this is let me work on the personal so that people can understand how it functions and what's going on because systems and institutions are made by people and they're also upheld by people and they can only be torn down by people. So people have yeah. to understand this internally. What is yeah. going on within me? It has to me. be an individual thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. where I really And that's why the book is so important as well. Right. Where I really get hope from, though, is that each per each one of us is responsible for creating hope. We create hope through our actions. So hope isn't something that we hope will get there. We hope it will happen. No, we have to create the hope. We have to be the change to make that hope into a reality. Uh, it's been so interesting to speak to you. Uh, the book is uh, Me and White Supremacy. You can see what I've done to my copy here, mm -hmm. Layla. We're on video at the moment. I love it. Um, and there's a young adult version um, and uh, it's great. It explains things beautifully and there are real examples in there. Um, and I can't wait to get my daughter to read it um, and ask her to do some of the work in here as well. It's been such a privilege to speak to you and so interesting as well. Layla Efsad, author of Me and White Supremacy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Uh